You know, we're living in a society. But they want to deliver vast amounts of information over the internet. It's, it's a series of tubes. We're supposed to act in a civilized way. Allison, can you explain what internet is? Welcome. Hello, hello. Welcome back, you guys. Uh, not to be rude, but why did you click on this episode? It's kind of a big deal, you know? You probably have a million things competing for your attention right this very second. One of the biggest ruling forces of the entire internet, and maybe the world, is your attention. Your attention is so valuable that nearly every corner of society would do anything for a small slice of it. Politicians, scientists, tech companies, journalists, and yes, even podcasters. On today's indirect message, the attention economy, how your attention became so valuable and how unseen forces are trying to hijack it. To understand the attention economy, we need to think for a moment like an economist. Economists study how scarce resources are allocated. Resources like money, housing, or food. For most of human history, the scarce resource has been food. We needed productive land and the right conditions to grow food to survive. During the Industrial Revolution, manufacturing helped us grow a lot more food with a lot less work. But skilled labor was in short supply to run all those factories and machines. During the 1900s, with a surplus of food and goods, the scarcity then became information. Information about which foods and goods were the best. Advertisers tried to inform us and convince us that their products were the best. If you want shoes with lots of pep, get kids, kids, kids. Or bounce and zoom in every step, get kids, kids. Which brings us to today. As we all know, information is no longer scarce. Far from it, we've actually got all of it in our pockets. Part of why we have so much information today is that anyone can share it or even make it. We don't need a printing press or even a printer to reach millions of people all over the world. Which brings us to the attention economy. The attention economy refers to the supply and demand of attention there's a nearly infinite demand for attention, and yet each of us only has so much to give. Even if you were a robot person who never got distracted and never slept, you'd only have 24 hours of your attention to give every day. This makes your attention a scarce resource, and the race is on to see what services or companies can extract the most of it from you every day. This is why people pull incredibly stupid stunts for YouTube views. Today, I'm gonna to be pranking them for 24 hours, and if you're excited to see some of the pranks I have planned, then go ahead and give this video a like. It's why Yahoo tests more than 45,000 headlines every five minutes on their homepage. It's why services like Spotify offer a free version. It's not actually free, is it? We are paying them, not with money, but with our attention, to ads which they use to sell us stuff. In this sense, the attention economy is an economy of indirect transactions. It's largely driven by advertising. For instance, last year, Google made $160 billion. But did you give Google any money? Probably not. They made most of their money off selling ad space so that they could show it to you. So the more attention we give Google, rather than money, the more valuable Google becomes. And that goes for anything in an attention economy. The more attention something or someone gets, the more valuable and powerful they become. But all of that attention, all that power, doesn't necessarily improve our lives. Those attention thieves aren't trying to help us reach our goals. They're trying to use us to reach theirs. And all of this is precisely why it's so crucial for us to be aware of the ways that the attention economy tries to manipulate us and hijack our precious attention. My guest today is Ben Parr. He's the former editor of Mashable. He was named in Forbes 30 Under 30, and he's the author of Captivology, the science of capturing people's attention. He joined me to talk about seven key ways that advertisers and marketers try to exploit our instincts 
in order to grab our attention. I hope you enjoy our conversation. So where we put our attention, I think, is not something that a lot of people think about very consciously. Um, it's just something that we do. We just click on things, we watch things, um, and that's that. So why do you think it's useful for people who aren't necessarily marketers or brands to understand how to get people's attention? Attention is the fundamental currency of the modern economy. Literally, if you want to do anything in the modern world, you have to get the attention of something or someone. And it's harder than ever to do so. Whether, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're starting a company, you get the attention of investors and of customers. You're in Hollywood or you want to be a musician, you got to get the attention of fans and of agents and such. Or you're a teacher, you got the attention of students, parents getting the attention of their kids. It's a fundamental flow of information, but information doesn't flow if you're not getting their attention. It's like the pipes of human existence at the moment. It's obvious why businesses and, you know, tech and advertisers are thinking a lot about how to hold our attention. Um, so in your book, you talk about some of the attention triggers that they try to pull, right? Some of the tricks they use to catch our attention and to keep us engaged with their products. So I want to kind of go through some of those and discuss what they are. There's two models from my book. One is about how attention works, the three stages of attention, I like to call it in terms of how we pay attention both to super short-term stimuli versus like long-term interest in things. And then I came up with a set of triggers that were universal across cultures, across everything. It doesn't matter who you are, what language you speak. These things just capture attention at a fundamental psychological level. On one end of the spectrum, in the like first of the seven triggers is automaticity, which is that we naturally automatically respond to, in certain ways to certain colors and stimuli. You know, if you hear a gunshot in the air, you will automatically duck. It's a reflex, but it's also our attention trying to protect us. Because thousands of years ago, when we saw like a rustle in the bushes, catching that was either going to help us get our next meal or was going to help us protect us from like the next predator. And so that was how our attention has been tuned to protect ourselves. Modern day, we don't have saber tooth tigers stalking us, but we're still looking for that new and novel information. And certain things can really trigger that. If there's a push notification on your phone, you will naturally look at it. You are hardwired to do that because that's new and novel information and you almost cannot help yourself. And like there's tons of these different kinds of automated triggers that like smell, sight, sounds that change the way we behave. Right. So is the automaticity trigger kind of like the core trigger? <laughs> like things that immediately threaten our safety, get our attention unwaveringly the fastest and then things that maybe have grown out of survival threats, like the colors you were talking about, um, kind of ride that same effect. I would frame it slightly differently. And how I would frame it is you need automaticity in order to capture long-term attention. Which you kind of liken to kindling for starting a fire. The bonfire of attention. I love my metaphors. I think it's a great metaphor. Yeah. Okay, cool. So the automaticity is our kindling for the fire. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's talk about the second theory that you kind of go over. In the book, I talk about this in terms of the framing trigger. And so the framing trigger, actually more important than ever, than even when I first wrote the book, which is that we pay attention to things that fall within our frame of reference and tend to ignore things that fall outside of our frame of reference. It's social engineering in a way. No one wants to feel like they're left out. They're going to pay attention to the things that their friends are seeing and doing and want that sense of validation as well wherever they are. This is why, you know, like people want to join the next social network where their friends are talking or not like be looped out of like the text thread because your friends might say something that you or like oh, even a stranger group made like that you don't really know those people. You don't want to miss something for whatever reason, even though 90% of the time you just don't care. FOMO plays a really, really strong part in our perception of attention and more importantly, and how we perceive the value of things. Yeah, uh, it reminds me of, you know, a lot of YouTubers will do these t-shirt campaigns where they're like, there's only 500 t-shirts or something and you only have 24 hours. And um, I remember my agents were trying to get me to do this a while ago. I didn't end up doing it because I just hate selling things. But they said, look, there's like a 20 or 30 percent higher sales for t-shirts that are sold for only one day versus t-shirts that you'll 
keeping your shop forever, which I find so interesting. It's artificial scarcity. The company I started is in e-commerce and we see this kind of drop mentality all the time or like this discount's a limited time only or you only have five minutes to claim this thing. Mm -hmm. That kind of, uh, I guess, highlights the importance of being aware of these triggers and techniques that we will see around us all the time. The third one that I have here is the disruption trigger. Disruption is simple. It's that we pay attention to things that violate our expectations. And so this comes back to the original discussion we had about food or threat. If something violates our expectations of the world, we pay attention to it because of our fight or flight, of our defense response. That's going to be some kind of like threat potentially. This is why shock jock, shock value really does capture attention. You're seeing it in politics. You're seeing it in certain marketing tactics. You overuse it. Uh, it loses its value. But in the right kinds of ways and situations, people really pay attention, um, especially when something like, you know, shocks the entire overall system. So one example I talk about in the book is how Patagonia, you know, famous for a campaign where they say, don't buy this jacket. And they're a clothing brand and they're telling everyone in the New York Times, don't buy our jacket, which is against like your expectations. They're trying to sell you stuff. But then they explain why they're telling you that because they're about eco-conscious like clothing. They're telling you that they want to like help you repair your clothes if you can. And that adds like more brand value. Yeah, I feel like we see this one all over YouTube all the time. People put disruption triggers in their headlines constantly. Things that are meant to kind of throw us off of what we expect from someone. I've been doing a deep dive recently into headline construction. Not just like YouTube and articles. And it's crazy because the formulas are all the same. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's number, adjective, thing, promise. And there's some kind of missing mystery element to like, I want to know how these like these 15 hacks that are going to change your personal career forever. <laughs> so they've already FOMO'd you. Um, they've given you something super simple to go and latch on to. And like, if you just like, Again, you repeat this process again because people are looking for new and novel information and trying to like, uh, they're latching on because it's new and novel information. And now the thought is not complete because I need to know what those 15 things are. And often comes down to those lizard brain instincts, survival instincts. Right. Like the subverted expectations that comes from the lizard brain. It's harder for people to latch on to more complex like topics and thoughts, which is also, I think, a part of the political issues right now, which is just... People have a hard time talking about complex topics and the nuances behind them. You want to have like there's a right or wrong answer. There's like an explanation to everything in the world when in reality there is not often a clean explanation for everything in the world and that is not something that our lizard brains really like. Yeah, that's true. I actually think the next uh, trigger is related to that in a sense, the political um, sort of satisfaction that we're seeking, which is the reward trigger asking what are we getting from this content, right? And uh, you talk a little bit about extrinsic and, and intrinsic rewards. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to speak to that trigger a little bit? I interviewed Dr. Michael, uh, one of the like leading researchers at the University of Michigan on this subject. And he did these like tests with lab mice where he found that if you take the dopamine out of mice, what happens is not that they can't feel pleasure, it's that they'd lose all motivation to do things. So they would stop eating. They'd stop caring about things. A lot of them would even die because they didn't have the motivation to go and do things. They didn't want to go and access the rewards, right? And so food is a reward. These kinds of things are rewards. And so there's all sorts of interesting things when it comes to like the reward centers of the body. Mm -hmm. And so there are two types. This is like a very research topic compared to like some of the other pieces of the book which is like intrinsic rewards are like the intrinsic things that like move my life, uh, like social acceptance and well-being and personal health and interpersonal relationships. And external rewards are things like that are external, food, money, sex. Both things have a role to play in our attention. So this is like the one where like I talk all about careers, right? Because for a job to keep attention and for you to be satisfied, you have to both have the external rewards, like the salary, the bonuses. Those things must be there. But also the intrinsic things need to be there as well. Are you satisfied with what you're doing? Do you enjoy the work? Do you enjoy the people you work with? 
if both things are not there, it doesn't work. And for most things, you need to have the intrinsic and extrinsic rewards. This is why you know brands have loyalty programs. One big thing is that unexpected rewards have a larger impact on our attention and our memory than expected rewards. Like I expect to get a cake if I get a thousand points or whatever it is. But if you know the airline just suddenly dropped, you've been a random loyal customer for a while. Here's a five hundred dollar voucher. Thanks for being a partner. I'm going to have much stronger affinity towards that brand because I didn't expect it. So how is the reward trigger used in the media? There's a couple of things that media companies do and have had to evolve and do, right? Farther past, uh, there was less of like, I need to get people to go and click on a thing. It was more about long-term loyalty to the brand of the newspaper and to the reporters behind it. And so they built like more intrinsic, like, I trust this thing. It has that sort of cachet. Ma- broken a major story that's disrupted like the news cycle so i have to go pay attention disruption to good play modern times for unfortunately for some of these like media brands you have to do some more of the 18 things that elon musk you know puts on his body in order to become super i don't know you get the idea more ridiculous all the kinds of things but like there's the extrinsic reward of like you're gonna learn the secret to superpowers or to being a sex god or whatever it is the secret knowledge is kind of a a reward that's a reward yeah but there's like i think the better ones tend to focus on the intrinsic which is like your identity your value for better for worse a lot more publications are tribe focused right and youtube channels too right there's a tribe for those who are in very much into gaming or into esports there's a tribe for those who are into cooking you can really go verticalized in media in youtube in anything And really go down deep that rabbit hole and you build like that intrinsic relationship Mm -hmm. with that community and with that leader. Yeah. So part of the appeal of these various media outlets is they are representing a set of values and identities. And we are affirmed in our own values and identities by consuming their media. And I think that's part of why you see so much polarization now is because of this sort of tribalistic reward element that is coming into the internet because it catches our attention as an additional note tribalism has always been really important you need community you need family it's yeah. part of the human condition you know we used to get that out of like our small like groups and villages religion became you know a central identity piece sports has been an identity piece but you know religion has like an as like decreased for much of the population and so now in some ways politics is becoming um i think to the detriment of all of us in some ways, the tribe that you aspire to or ascribe to. All right, let's talk about the reputation trigger. So the reputation trigger is the fact that we tend to pay greater attention to reputable sources of information. And I kind of divide it into a couple major classes. You know, there's authority figures, which have our attention because they have power over us. They can punish us in some kind of way whether that is a world leader or your like your immediate boss. Uh, but the one that's most important out of all of them is the expert. And we pay attention to experts because we are not able to become an expert in every topic, right? You and I are not going to become experts in the next like couple of hours in neutron stars or solar conditions. But there is somebody out there, there's a scientist, there's whatever, who is an expert in that kind of thing. I think we've seen it like this year with like the experts in uh, epidemiology or in like for COVID and things like that and lots of people listening. But there is a flip side that I think has come more clear, which is what people consider experts is dependent upon your frame of reference. So it's, it's similar to the an appeal to authority, which may be a more common concept that people out there have heard of, right? We are... Our attention is drawn to people who we see as authority figures. Um, One interesting dynamic that I think has come out of the quantification of popularity on social media is that we equate authority with with popularity. And this has probably always, you know, been around. But now we can see the numbers, right? Um, For instance, on, on Twitter, you know, people will have arguments and stuff. And I think it's tempting to sort of see the right argument as the person with more likes, right? my equals right and all of that it makes sense at a high level because like you want to pick a restaurant what's the first app you're going to open yelp probably yelp right but 
generally the crowd works really well for telling you like a restaurant is great or not because of crowdsource information. However, a crowd can definitely go astray in a whole bunch of different ways, like on a social media platform. Yeah, I think when we intellectualize it, people know that. It's like, well, obviously, right? But I think there is also this sort of like gut instinct, this trigger perhaps, that kind of leads us to, I don't know, gravitate toward popularity as as rightness. Um, okay, let's talk about the mystery trigger. I love this one because everyone loves a mystery, right? I called this the compulsion for completion because we are compelled to go and complete a train of thought, a storyline, uh, a thing. And when it's not completed, it sticks in our head like a, like a little like thorn or whatever in the back of your brain. And so, you know, the greatest and best storytelling uh, has that kind of mystery piece. This is where cliffhangers come from. You're like, I really want to know what happens next. Like th these thematic things are in almost every form of storytelling. I want to know what, the, what happens, what the ending is. And the greatest storytellers find a way to subvert our expectations and not just like give you the answer, but open up a whole new set of questions that you have to go and answer in the next episode. Okay, let's talk about the acknowledgement trigger, uh, the need to feel seen, heard, and validated. It's the most powerful of all the triggers. It's the most long-term one, right? If automaticity is for immediate attention, acknowledgement is for long-term attention. And it's we pay attention to the people and things who give us uh, that validation, that empathy, that understanding. And, you know, I talk about celebrities and celebrity theory in this. So I talk about, in particular, the parasocial relationship, how we can feel very strongly feelings about whether it's a Taylor Swift or a YouTuber or a politician in a way that almost defies logic. The parasocial relationship is our ability to build what feels like a two-way relationship when it's really a one-sided relationship. And, you know, you need to have that in order to have good functioning governments and to have like uh, functioning nations and to build that, you know, uh, tribes that are important. But it goes to the point where like, you know, a celebrity can go do a drop and make millions of dollars on their e-commerce website. One thing I talk about is um, Taylor Swift doing Swiftness where she stalks five of her fans and sends them gifts and then does videos about it. And what she's proving is that by caring about a small, like one or two or a few of her fans, she's showing she, she cares about all of her fans that can put themselves into their shoes and feel that kind of thing. The best brand, the smartest brands use it. They build the like long-term loyalty from it. Obviously too, that also, as I think we have all seen, can also be manipulated in the wrong hands. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think that this trigger kind of underlies social media itself as well, right? We like to use social media in many ways because it validates us. We like getting acknowledgement. I want to talk about um, some of the problems that have come out of the attention economy, that have come out of this environment where what we pay attention to is one of perhaps the most scarce resources that there is. There's so many drawbacks <laughs> that have come more clear, right? It's harder for people to pay attention for a longer period of time to one thing. And it's not because like their attention's become a goldfish or anything like that. It's just because there's more other things competing for their attention. And so that makes it harder to focus in on one thing, turn off everything else and just be like, I'm gonna spend four hours just writing this thing and writing a book. And the problem in my life with being constantly distracted, making it hard to focus, is that it's harder to achieve those long-term goals, right? Things that we have to really put our attention into and spend a long time focusing that attention are often the things that we get the most intrinsic value from. And so now it feels like there's this little, like, you know, annoying um, tapping on your shoulder every few seconds that's trying to pull you out of that focus. One other negative, too, um, is just like the overall tribalism that we're seeing right now which is like paying attention to a specific subgroup because we can't pay attention to the entire world. Um, and there's also a sub piece of this, which is information has to go out quicker because we are expecting that with rapid real-time information. And I think like, you know, I think journalism is a really important institution, but because information has to go out quicker than like maybe 10, 20 years ago, there's less time to do some of the fact checking and things. And one or like errors naturally happen, but 
even one or two of those degrade our trust in the institutions of media or other things. Yeah, I wanted to ask you if you think that the attention economy is encouraging more extremism. I do. It's encouraging people to pay attention to a narrow set of ideas and go deeper down a specific rabbit hole, whichever kind of rabbit hole it is. Um, and that results in you naturally not listening to as many other kinds of takes or opinions, right? With the extremism online, it's really about having, you know, these novel ideas you were talking about where we are constantly seeking out more and more novel um, experiences and information. And so if you're, you know, if the old stuff that was maybe novel is getting boring, well, now we have, you know, we need to ratchet it up. We need to constantly be turning up the volume on some of these conversations and taking them into more and more extreme places so that people pay attention. I'm hopeful that we will adapt and we will swing back, but it's hard to say. Right now, we are in echo chambers of our own design and of algorithmic design. And it's partly been necessary because we can't pay attention to everything happening and it's overwhelming. But then the end result is people who really only ever get information from one or two or a few groups of sources, from the people who maybe have not the most expertise, but the most explosive personalities. I think experts are like, they can sort of work through the contours and the, the nuances of a given issue, right? And that doesn't catch our attention. We don't want a long, you know, lecture about all the different parts of a problem. We want to have a really hard, firm stance, pro or con. So I feel like a lot of these triggers are used in that way. But it's not all bad. And I, th I think that there is a temptation when we talk about, you know, the attention economy. There's a tendency to be a little bit like, I don't know, alarmist about it. It's all doom and gloom. But there are some silver linings, right? But now you can have cross-collaboration, international cooperation. Like my company that I started, uh, Octane AI, has 50 employees in over 12 countries. Would never have been possible 10 years ago. And so we have this much more global perspective about the world we're not thinking like oh like it's left or right because every country has different political affiliation whatever we're just thinking very globally you just have to be like aware of what the potential downsides are and mitigate it that's what i think we're getting in that phase right now we weren't prepared for it now we're preparing for it so we're talking all about it but like over the long run you know technology does i think make the world better the printing press made the world better electricity made the world better these things did make the world like more connected and did bring a lot of positives. There's consequences to it, and we just have to learn how to deal with those things or mitigate it or build new technologies that help us with it. Thanks to Ben Parr for his help on this episode, and to learn more, do check out his book, Captivology. Thanks for joining me, you guys, for sharing your precious attention. I'll see you next time. <laughs>